It's lovely, lovely, very lovely to see you all today. Um, thank you very much for taking the time out of your diary to sacrifice to come here. Um, I really hope you're going to feel blessed by what, what we're going to go through together, our journey together. Um, I'd like to pray and then I want to also just um, introduce my colleagues and give you a bit of an introduction. Is that okay? Yes. Amen. Amen. Lovely. Dear Lord Jesus, we love you very much indeed and we thank you for the stay that you've made. I want to thank you so much, Lord Jesus, for all of the brothers and sisters that are gathered today. I thank you for their sacrifice, willingness to, to be involved in this day, especially as we're going to be looking at such an important topic of, of the gospel message and how we are to take it to the lost. Lord Jesus, I want to pray that this will be on our hearts really heavily. I pray that you're going to move us, stir us, equip us, educate us in this area of evangelism and reaching the lost. Please, Lord Jesus, I want to pray for your Holy Spirit to be really felt and sensed here today. I want to pray that we would be open and have have open ears, teachable hearts. We say this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. Amen. So, um, I would love to just uh, ask just each of my colleagues um, just to share with you, just for a few minutes, the, a bit more about, more than their name and where they come from, but what they do, what they're about. Um, so, um, Owen oh, oh, and Gustav, can you just both come up? And, um, it's been really wonderful working with these two guys. Um, Owen, he, he'll tell you, we've, we've been working together in Ukraine, and uh, Gustavo is one of our evangelists in the United States. That tells us over to you. From the Māori warrior from Aotearoa, New Zealand, to the African warriors, <laughs> I bring you blessings from yeah. the nation Aotearoa, New Zealand. I'm an avid supporter of South African rugby oh, yeah. because you have Pierce Spears, yeah. and Pierce Spears love Jesus, and that's why they won. Yeah. If you're a praying team, you will win. And so I bring you blessings. I'm so grateful to be here amongst brothers who have the same heart to preach the gospel. Matthew 28, the Great Commission. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, I am currently serving as a chaplain for a special forces team in Ukraine. And I've humbly been able to uh, go labor and partner with Tony's GCS to take in food and aid and find solutions uh, for peace. So blessed are the peacemakers. Yes. For they are the sons of God. So Amen. I pray that your eyes would see, your ears would hear, and your heart, the capacity to receive all that the Lord has for you. Because our Father is a good Father. The Lord Jesus is throne in heaven, has all power, has the authority, yes, sir. has the keys. The, Lord, the Holy Spirit is here to teach you more. So God bless you all. Hey. Amen. Well, thank you, guys. My name is Gustavo. I'm actually originally from Colombia, South America. So I don't speak his language, but I speak Spanish. You guys speak Spanish? ¿Cómo están? Bien? ¿Todo está bien? Ah, you see, you speak Spanish. So that's great. So like Tony said, I'm an evangelist in the United States of America. Actually, right now I'm in Sarasota. And I'm so excited to be here, guys. I'm actually receiving so much from this culture. Yes. You guys have so much passion, so much zeal. Oh, and you guys are ready to, to receive the gospel. You know, so I'm, I'm grateful. I'm, I'm here trying to serve your country, but I'm the opposite. I'm receiving it. And I'm calling my wife and my people over there in the United States, and I'm telling them, listen, we need passion in America. Yeah. We, need, we need what people Hallelujah. Yeah. So I'm very excited to be here, guys, and to learn with you and see your culture. Uh, and the way you guys sing, man, I'll tell you that. You guys can sing, man. That's amazing. You know, the, the, the guys in the prison, you know, in, in their situation, they're struggling. And the way they were singing, you know, my heart just tore, you know, broken. And listening to these prisoners, you know, singing to the Lord Jesus Christ, man, it just broke my heart. 
So I'm receiving so much from your culture. I'm trying to, to give here, but I'm, at the same time, I'm so much encouraged by your, your love and your, and your kindness and the way, the, the, the respect that you have, you guys carry it in your culture. It's amazing. So God bless you guys. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. So um, for those of you that uh, are not fully acquainted with our organization, um, our organization uh, is called Great Commission Society. Um, and uh, we call it GCS for, for short. And um, basically, yeah, we've been working all over the world. One of our dear places to minister is South Africa. Done so for a little, uh, nearly 20 years. Favorite part is going to prisons um, because that's where the Jesus saved me in prison. Um, and um, and also we're working in, in well we're working in um, 115 countries, um, many Islamic countries. I was only not long ago in Pakistan again. We must remember to pray for Pakistan since they arrested Imran Khan. There's lots of um, lots of uh, violence happening, mindless stuff, um, and Christians getting persecuted along the way um, in Southeast Asia, in Buddhist countries, wow. working in orphanages, in the favelas of Brazil, um, and schools, anywhere where there are humans. <laughs> uh, if we can find humans, then we've got work to do there, yes, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, so as a summary, um, my eyesight's not very good, but um, here's what our organization tries to do around the world. Um, as an international um, NGO, we are involved in global leadership, we spearhead international expansion, so we've got teams in 48 nations that reach into 115. But we're, 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 we're just frustrated. We want to get to every country because that's the Great Commission. We train the trainers. That's part of what we're doing today. We've got about 200 training modules in evangelism and discipleship. We're going to maybe cover, I don't know, maybe eight or ten sessions today. Um, we've got about 3,000 volunteers, a little over, working in our organization globally. Um, and we get involved in community impact. So that means we try to get the gospel into prisons, schools, uh, anywhere there, where there are people, as I said. There's a lot of uh, fundraising needed for that. We try to help people in a humanitarian way, providing water, food security, medical support, and we're, we're fighting against modern slavery. Um, um, as Owen mentioned, we've been working a lot in Ukraine. Um, if I can just maybe, I don't know if you're interested to know, but. We have 87 team members in Ukraine um, before the war started. And um, the moment the war broke out, we, we sent missionaries, 300 missionaries from Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, Moldova, to the borders. And in the very beginning, between February and March, we were taking food supplies um, into these areas near to uh, the capital, Kiev, um, in the reasonably safe part of the country, although in the first part of the, um, the war, in about April time actually, I was in Kiev and a missile blew up uh, 800 meters from me. It was awful because it was a civilian area, dead people on the floor, lots of injured, not a soldier in sight. And um, that was in April. Um, anyway, we focused on the refugees evacuating. So uh, this is at the border, this is in Romania, in Suret. Um, women and children in the snow. We got out of the car for five minutes, so I needed to get back in the car. And there are women there for 10, 12 hours with babies. Um, my goodness, I can't begin to tell you, I'm lost for words. Um, this is going back to February and March. And uh, our teams were actively involved in trying to help people. Um, we have many contacts in America that are Ukrainian. They speak the language, and so they came over willingly to join us. And of course, whoever we met, we were sharing the gospel with them. Uh, why did we want to do that? We wanted to do that because these people are facing death. And, you know, it's so important that they hear the gospel. If they respond, it's, I'm not in control of that. Yes. But I am in control of telling them the message. So we would give them food, biscuits, blankets, uh, and the gospel. Here's some of our team members from Romania and some American friends here as well. 
And so now between April and May, we pushed forward further, even closer. We started to focus on the, the east and the south, where the real war is happening. And so that is where we've been focusing on the high risk groups. And so right now you're looking at the areas where we are focusing. This is literally where the war is. Most organizations, they're over here. Um, but we're literally on the front line. Um, so we've been taking um, lorry loads um, of uh, 5,100 tons of food into the country. Uh, we would buy the food, or we'll have organizations like RRT, to, to, they, they donated about 7% of our food supplies um, and lots of other supplies that we bought. And we'll take it through, we'll load it onto coaches. Um, Owen and I were there loading on the coaches. And then we'll drive across the country to, um, in these coaches to the east. Um, and what we would do is that we will unload, give it the food to the people, um, but we would do that after we shared the gospel. Um, because they, they all wanted us to pray for them. And so we shared our testimonies, we shared the gospel. They were really open, they listened so well. Um, here's some of our team members. Uh, Tamara is from America, she's Ukrainian. Um, and she, she's based over there a lot. Uh, Ruslan is a, 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 a dear Ukrainian brother. Um, and this is Ira, she makes all of our videos. Uh, and then we would evacuate people, take them back to the uh, other side of the country. Um, and this, uh, uh, when the, the people were on the, on the coaches, we would share the gospel with them there. And they were so glad to hear the gospel. They, they knew they needed more than food and evacuation. They needed protection from God. Uh, we would stay in the refuges on the floor with them. It's quite sobering, wasn't it, <laughs> uh, to do that. And so let me summarize. I don't want to go on too much here. So far, we've evacuated 57,644 people, um, and we've delivered 5,100 tons of food. We've mobilized 500 volunteers. We have established a GCS Ukraine platform over there as well, and we help provide health, safe housing, food, uh, we support children who have lost their parents, and so on. Um, here's some of our colleagues uh, in Ukraine that we work with. There's that sign I was talking about, Owen. Yes. Um, and we collaborate with our government organizations. I can't tell you really about all the people here, but there are some pretty important people here who are responsible for military operations. They help us know the safe routes to travel to and back. Um, had the chance to meet up with the Minister of Defence, sorry, the, the Deputy Minister of Health, sorry, um, who gives us requests for medicine. Um, this is one of our charity ambassadors, Ron Mark, um, who came over there with us, um, and he's the former Minister of Defence of New Zealand. Um, and I got to know him through Owen. And so um, he came over, he got to meet the Deputy Minister of Defence, uh, Denis Shaparov, and so uh, we don't get involved in military stuff, only the humanitarian and the evangelistic. And we continue on a monthly basis. Um, can I just show you this image here? Uh, where the red is, is where the Russians occupy. And our teams bring in food supplies and we are working right there. And so we hear bombs happening on a regular basis. Um, it's quite scary, but amazingly, even though we're feeling scared, and I'll be honest with you, we all are, I mean, I'm not afraid of anything, I can tell you, but you still feel fear. And yet when we're there, I tell you, you see Jesus everywhere. Because uh, like, we're going there and we shouldn't really be going there, it's crazy. There are bombs coming yeah. down, but what is enabling us? It's Jesus Christ. Yes. Um, you know, we're driving there and like, we feel like we're, they talk about the armour of God. Uh, we talk about it, we talk about it, you know, we quote the Bible verse, we get a bit religious about it. But there, we are wearing the armour of God. And it goes beyond the bulletproof vest. It's protecting our soul. And it's almost like, to, to, to live is Christ, to die is gain. And like, uh, it makes our faith real, you know what I mean? Yes, praise God. This is Bakhmut. Bakhmut is the area where there's a, a height of battle right now. <coughs> anyway, um, there we are.
Um, you know what? Um, we, we, we come here today as evangelists to try to equip you and sharpen you up as much as possible. The Bible says iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another, yes? Now, um, I'm not coming to you as a teacher, a professor, uh, or, or somebody with qualifications. Actually, I don't believe in qualifications. God doesn't call the qualified, he qualifies the called. Amen. I come to you as a student. I come to you as a student who's just trying to put into practice uh, my faith. Um, uh, you know, uh, we will hopefully learn from each other. And I hope that, that some of the material you're going to come across today, if you've heard it already, some of you may have, well, I hope you maybe get to learn it. If you haven't, I hope you enjoy it. And I'd like you to know, if you would like to have copies of the material, any handouts electronically or what have you, we can provide it to you. Um, duplication is encouraged. Okay? So you can have this. And my intention is if you would like to teach this in your church, to your group, then that is real success for me. Okay? You can teach it like it's from you. I don't care. Just teach it. Are you with me? Thank you. So, let me begin. And please, don't take anything personal. I'm not trying to be hard on you, um, but I do want us to be awake, okay? Yes, sir. So, I want to ask you the question today, um, what, what is evangelism? And as I ask you this question, I ask you to tell me, what does evangelism mean? I'm not after a sermon, I'm after maybe one sentence to describe what does evangelism mean? Can I have hands? Who would like to... Maybe give me an answer. What is evangelism? Please. And, yeah, yes, sir. According to Matthew, I think uh, what you just showed is to tell the good news about Jesus Christ, his saving grace, and his soon coming. Thank you. To tell the good news. Well, that's wonderful. Yes, ma'am. To me, is to tell the world for people out there about Jesus, the kingdom of God. Love it. Jesus Christ. Fantastic, thank you. Anybody else? Yes? For me, it's reaching out to lost souls. Sorry? Reaching out to lost souls. Reaching out to lost souls, thank you. Any other definitions? Yes? Yes, it's to go out there and tell people about how to, what Jesus will do there. Lovely, thank you. Yes? This is bringing people to Jesus. Bringing people to Jesus. Bringing people to Jesus, thank you, lovely. Let's have one or two more. Yes. To be the gospel. Hmm? To be the gospel. To be the gospel, yes. Yes. To raise up disciples. Thank you, yes. Telling the lost about a saint that came to die for the sins. Thank you. They're all great answers, um, thank you. Well look, let me, um, I'll ask you in a slightly different way now, okay? Because I, I get the idea, you're giving me a good idea about sharing the gospel, making disciples and and, and this, yes, roughly. Um, but I wonder, you know, um, tell me what you think. The activities I'm going to show you, I'd like you to tell me, do you think they're evangelism? Yes or no? Are you with me? Yes. Um, if it's yes, then I want you to raise your hand. If it's no, then I, your hand will not be up. Are you with me? Yeah. So you're going to take part whether you like it or not. <laughs> if your hand's not up, that means you are telling me no. Do you understand me? So you have to make a decision. Um, and don't look at the person to the left or right, because they might be getting it wrong. And nobody will be judged, okay? I might have a go at you later, but don't worry. I don't bite. <laughs> I just bark. So, number one. Praise and worship and singing. Is this evangelism? Yes or no? Hands up or down? If it's, it's evangelism, is it evangelism? Yes or no? Yes, 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 yes. So many hands are going up. One or two hands are down. Okay, thank you. You get the idea. Praying for the salvation of the lost. Is that evangelism? Yes or no? Hands up. Let me see your hands. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, or the virtue, or yeses. One, no. Okay. Worship in a church is evangelism. Yes or no? I need to see your hands. No? Yeah. Okay, this is slightly divided. Okay. Um, fasting for the lost. Is it evangelism? Yes or no? Let me see your hands, please. Okay. Um, food parcel ministries for the lost, where you're giving food to people that are hungry. Feeding programs. Is it evangelism? Yes or no? Let me see your hands. 
So many yeses, thank you. Um, community projects for a lot for the lost. There's so many types, aren't there? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Making friends with non-Christians. Is that evangelism? Yes or no? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, counseling a non-Christian. It could be for anything. Yes or no? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Um, only a few more. Giving a basic testimony. Is that evangelism? Yes or no? Let me see your hands. Okay. Majority are saying yes to virtually everything. Modeling a godly life before non-Christians. Yes, is that evangelism? Okay. Um, demonstrating love and grace. Is it evangelism? Yes or no? Okay. Um, number 12. A non-Christian person experiencing a miraculous answer to prayer. Is that evangelism? Yes or no? Yes, yes. Okay. Meeting the felt needs of non-Christians. It could be anything, really, couldn't it? Um, hands up, yes or no? Thank you. Um, number 14. Answering the hard questions non-Christians have about God. Is it evangelism? Yes or no? That's apologetics, right? Hands up. Yes, 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 yes. You know, it's mostly yeses. Um, any activity that draws a non-Christian closer to the point of conversion. Is that evangelism? Yes or no? Yes, yes, yes. 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 We've got some adamant yeses. Thank you. Last one. Winning souls. Is evangelism winning souls? Yes, yes it is. <laughs> <laughs> I've been evangelizing now for 25 years, quite aggressively and intentionally. Mm. And what I have learned in 25 years, and what we have brought together in our teaching that we provide in Bible colleges around the world, none of those activities are evangelism. Sure. Not one single item on that list mm. by itself is evangelism. And please don't give me the, the semantics, oh yes, but is evangelism is this plus this. No, I asked you a simple question and you gave me a wrong answer. Sure. None of those items are evangelism. Mm -hmm. None of them. It's not your fault. I tell you whose fault it is, it's Satan's fault. Satan hates you. He hates our Lord Jesus. He will stop at nothing to compromise your theology, your, your intimacy with Jesus, your understanding of, of biblical terminology. And so I made a big statement. Uh, here's little little me contradicting virtually all of you. Now I'm not going to leave you there. I want to equip you in the next hour. Why are these things not evangelism? Why? You see, all of you, of course, you know roughly what evangelism is. It's as you said to me. It's sharing the gospel. Yes. It's telling people about Jesus. Yes. That's not the problem. I have no doubt that most of you have a sound, basic understanding. The problem comes is when you say evangelism is proclaiming the gospel and sharing a testimony and feeding the hungry. Because the moment you start doing that, you're now creating your own definition of evangelism. All right. Please don't do that with biblical words. Mm. With biblical words, we need to be accurate. Are you with me? Yes. We need to be deadly accurate. Because it is a game of life and death here. Sure. Sure. Let me, let me, let me, I want to help you now to really equip you as much as possible. And if at the end you've got loads of questions, you can fire it away. I don't promise to have the answer, but I'll try. Now, when we read the Bible and there are words, there's, there's things we don't fully understand, that what you do? You pray. You ask the Holy Spirit to give you an understanding. But we do that, and there's still widespread confusion in the church about what biblical words mean. There are so many fragmentations and, and denominations and divisions. So what do you do when there's still widespread confusion? Well, what you do is you go to a scholar. You go to somebody who knows the stuff, yeah? Who, somebody with a bit more white hair than me. Somebody who's like, you know, oh, they studied all their lives. Are you with me? That's why people go to Bible college. They want to learn and train properly. Amen? Well, let's turn to some leading scholars. Um, according to two of the world's leading Bible scholars, 
Dr. John Stott and Dr. J.I. Packer, who are both with the Lord Jesus now. Uh, these are amazing, amazing scholars. Listen to how they defined evangelism. They said that evangelism is simply the proclamation of the gospel. Evangelism is the proclamation of the gospel. Now, please, can I ask you all, would you mind repeating this with me three times? Evangelism. Evangelism is the proclamation. Is the proclamation of the gospel. Of the gospel. Again, evangelism, evangelism is the proclamation of the gospel. Of the gospel. Evangelism. Evangelism is the proclamation, is the proclamation of, the of the gospel. You know what? It'd be lovely. It's really successful today if we can leave retaining and protecting and defending this simple biblical definition of the word euangelion. The original Greek word euangelion, the word, for, the word for evangelism, means the proclamation of the gospel. But why? Well, let's have a little history lesson. According to history, the evangelist was nothing more than a runner. Uh, the runner would carry the good news of a military victory that was written on a scroll that he's carrying in his hand. So they won the war, and the, 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 the soldiers would write up, the scribe would write down, we won the war, send the message all the way back with the evangelists who would run to the king. Something like Caesar, yeah? Um, and he would run to the king from the battlefields, he'll get on his knee, he'll unroll the scroll, and he will verbally announce the message on the scroll. We have won the war! That was evangelism. He was announcing the message. Are you with me? Oh, by the way, please note, the message was written on the scroll, and also the message was read. It was spoken. Are you with me? All right. That's an interesting little pointer to remember. The message was called the evangel. That's where, I guess, the root words to evangelism. And the evangel was actually the good news. So as simple as that, the messenger was the evangelist. The act of announcing the good news to the ruler was called evangelism. In a similar way, my brothers and sisters, the act of announcing the gospel to a non-Christian, that is evangelism. The act of announcing the gospel. Maybe it's written, maybe it's spoken, maybe it's typed. I, I'm not sure how you're going to communicate it. We have such a variety of ways today. But remember, Evangelism is not some word that you add more things to it just because we feel like we're, what, we're a little bit more wise and, and intelligent and we can stop playing around with biblical words. No, don't do that. You take the original word, you translate it accurately. Evangelism is the proclamation of the gospel and nothing else. Now, according to the Bible, we read in the, the book of Ephesians that there are some people in the church they have what is commonly understood as the gift of evangelism. It says there in Ephesians 4, 11 to 12, it was he who gave some to be prophets, pastors, teachers, apostles, and evangelists to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. If you are an evangelist, um, if you want to know your job description, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 to 12, to prepare, uh, to prepare God's people for works of service. That is the actual role of the evangelist, or, or the pastor, or the teacher, or the apostle. I'm not going to step outside of my territory. I, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a teacher, I'll leave that to the experts. But for evangelism, I'm still learning. That is what I'm going to talk about today. The job description of the evangelist is to prepare God's people. Now, how? How would they do that? Well, there are two methods that are used. Um, they're called reaching and teaching. Reaching and teaching. In other words, we're reaching non-Christians with the gospel. We should be doing that on a regular basis. And the other way is teaching. We teach Christians who do not have the gift of evangelism. We teach them how to do it. Did you know, um, how many people here consider themselves to be an actual evangelist? I'm not giving you a trick question, okay? <laughs> Don't be afraid to put, I'll put up your hand today. Um, who who thinks you're, feels like you're an evangelist? Anybody? Yeah, please. Cool. Yeah. This is so encouraging. That's lovely. So the people who didn't put their hands up, what's amazing is that 
anybody can evangelize. Anybody. You know what? God does not call the qualified, he qualifies the called. You are all called to evangelism. You are all called. Jesus said, go to the world and proclaim the gospel. To who? To all of the church. But, but the difference with the evangelists is that they've they got a, an extra challenge to teach others and motivate others. And, and don't always be a pain in the neck. <laughs> Try to be there working with the church, cooperating with the church, and supporting them. Are you with me? Reaching and teaching. Now, who else believes um, that evangelism is the proclamation of the gospel? Because I'm sure in this room here, many of you have been to Bible colleges, you've read lots of Christian books by different authors. I'm sure you're going to give me a list of names, you know, name dropping of all of your favorite preachers. <laughs> That's good. But who else believes that evangelism is a proclamation of the gospel? Well, let me tell you. Um, back in 1974, in Switzerland, in Lausanne, in the conference in Lausanne, and the Lausanne conference meets every year. It's a lovely conference to get to for world leaders of the church. And the reason why they met in 1974, in the beginning, they were meeting because they noticed that in the church, there were many strange teachings coming through from different parts of the world. There were some people that were starting to say, you don't need to go out to evangelize, God's going to reach them in the end. There were other people saying that, you know, well, we're all saved in the end. Um, and there were some strange teachings coming through. And so the theologians, they met to agree, what does the Bible teach? And I'm talking about people like Billy Graham, Jack Hayford, R.C. Sproul, J.I. Packer, hundreds of theologians they met. And all of them, they all agreed on this, okay? So this is not Tony telling you what I think. I'm sharing with you what we teach in Bible colleges, what happened in that convention. You can, buy, you can buy the book itself. It's a very boring book. Um, but, but, but there's lots of like theological stuff and you're going to... But this is what they say. Take a look. I'm going to break it down to make it simple because I, I, I want us to understand it. Five statements. Number one. They said that to evangelize is to spread the good news. Now can you see the lovely word there, spread? The reason why they use the, the word spread is because they were not restricting evangelism to the spoken word. They wanted to include the written word, because that is also evangelism. For example, in our organization, we have a ministry that has um, blind, deaf, and mute people. How do you think a mute Christian can share the gospel? They can't speak. <laughs> so why are you saying and insisting that evangelism is the only, only the spoken word? I tell you, our evangelists who are mute, they can't speak, they use sign language, they use literature, they are amazing, and you, you see them, and they love Jesus, and, and they just can't talk, but they're communicating, and they're communicating the gospel. Blind people, we have blind people, um, we also have a partnership work with Torch Trust for the Blind, we make Christian literature, and they, they make books in Braille. You can't see the words, but you can feel them. People who are deaf, how are they going to hear the gospel? <laughs> They're going to see the gospel, read the gospel. Are you with me? So, this is a very useful statement. Why is this encouraging? I bet there's many of you that feel very scared to evangelize. Let's be honest. 98% of the church do not share the gospel. And if you're anything like me or any other normal human, it's because, yeah, it's scary. <laughs> you know, like going up to somebody to tell them about Jesus and you know they don't like you, they don't want to hear your message. What's the motivation to go there? Yeah, and when you know that there are other evangelists, well, it's easy to leave it to them, isn't it? Mm. Well, I want to tell you, it's possible for you to share the gospel. If only you believe. You just got to believe there's, there's different ways. You don't have to evangelize like me or Owen or Gustavo, but find a way that you are comfortable to evangelize. Yes. We don't need another Tony Anthony or whoever. We need you. <laughs> we need you. We need individuals like you who will uniquely share the gospel in, in the way that's relevant to you. Uh, but, but if you don't know how, we can train you. The second thing they agreed, our Christian presence in the world 
It is indispensable to evangelism. Mm. <laughs> and what that means is that you, you, <laughs> look at you. You are Jesus' eyes, mouth, hands and feet in this world right now. You are the body of Christ. Are you with me? Yes. You are, every one of you is part of the Great Commission. You know, you are part of this. So, you know, don't think that, you know, on your body, for example, are you happily give away your ear or your eye or your mouth? Every part of your body is necessary. And in the body of Christ, every part of this body of Christ is necessary. Are you a mouth? Well, use your mouth. Are you the eyes? Are you the hands? Are you with me? Yes. Your presence is indispensable to evangelism. Thirdly, they agreed that evangelism it is the proclamation of the historical biblical Christ as Saviour and Lord. What they're trying to say is that there are many people that go around and they preach a version of the gospel. There are people that go up to people and say, hey my friends, Jesus loves you. Hallelujah. Amen. Let me pray for you. And that, that, that's it. They're saved. Nah. Really? Okay, well come to the puppy song with me and you try that technique over there. It's not going to really work for you too well. Yeah, it might work for you well in America or England or South Africa, but it won't work for you well in a Muslim country or a Hindu country or a Buddhist nation. You know, what does love mean? And who is Jesus? You haven't even described yet who he is. Yeah. We need to explain his identity to a Muslim friend. Jesus is merely a prophet. They don't acknowledge his, his identity. And so it's not their fault. Our role is to be a little bit more clear in our explanation. Yes, yes. Saying Jesus loves you can be quite misleading. Yeah. You know, yes, indeed, it might be the easy method. <laughs> I mean, trust me, if that was the way to lead people to Christ, oh, I'll do it. But saying to people Jesus loves you can, can be completely confusing. Yeah. In a world that's completely confused and upside down, yeah. who is a polar against Jesus Christ. Mm. You know what, friends? Stop preaching your version of the gospel. Mm. Stop preaching the historical biblical Lord Christ Jesus. as Saviour and Lord. Yes. A fourth point, my friends. They agree that we are called to identify ourselves with the Lord's new community. And what that was meant to say, there are many people, especially after COVID, who stopped going to church and they never went back. Um, and, and I'm sure many of them believe they can sustain their Christianity by watching God's TV. <laughs> or, or, or listening to a Christian radio station. Um, well, you know what? Yes, God can sustain life even in the wilderness. But my friends, that was not God's plan. Yeah, his plan is family. Yeah. His family. His, his, his plan is community. What, look at the, the hope that the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit, it's community. It's family. He wants to have a relationship with us. He wants to meet with us in person. And my friends, it's very hard to be a long distance believer. You know, friends, we need to actually believe, be baptized, be part of a fellowship of believers in some context. And by the way, that does, that does not mean church as we make it. All right. Yeah. I work with believers in Somalia who do not have churches. Yeah. But the Bible says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am also. Yes, sir. And that is their church. So don't forget to gather together to meet. Very important. Final point, and this is the most important of all in what they said about evangelism. The result of evangelism includes obedience to Christ, incorporation to a service, uh, in, in, and responsible service to God. What they were trying to say is that you know, real, true evangelism is more than just going up to people and, dro um, and um, dropping a message and then going off. Real evangelism is about actually sharing the gospel and discipling them, helping them to learn the scriptures, to grow in their faith, and to also learn what it means to be a Christian. It's not just about believing and repenting, it's also about serving, is it not? You know, the Bible says you'll know them by their fruit. Well, you'll only bear fruit if you're actually, actually working in the vineyard. We need to be working, we need to be ploughing, we need to be sowing, we need to be reaping. So here are five pointers that they came up with in this conference. Um, and that's very interesting. The Lausanne conference they meet every year. There's another conference, This We Believe, um, conference 2000, led by Legionnaire Ministries, with the late... Um, RC. Hmm? RC. 
R.R.C. Uh, 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 Sproul. R.C. Sproul, um, a tremendous preacher. And they also met to uh, define what is evangelism. Uh, it was attended by 229 of the world's leading Bible scholars. Again, Jack Hayford, um, Dr. J.I. Packer, um, and R.C. Sproul, and many, many more. And listen to the three points they agree. And this is the boring stuff now, are you with me? But it's like the foundations. We need to cover the foundations first. So what do they agree? Are you still with me? Yes. yes. Number one, in Affirmation 18, we are commanded to proclaim the gospel to all living persons. Evangelism is not an option to consider. <laughs> no, no, no. It is a command that we need to be obeying. It's the Lord's last command. It needs to be our first, number one priority. And by the way, yes, they use the word proclaim. And people ask me the question, so what do I do? Spread or proclaim? Well, again, that's where we, we try to make, make, make evangelism work for us. You need to answer that question. What are you willing to do for the Lord? How are you willing to serve? Are you willing to use your mouth, use your hands, use your skills, use your hospitality to communicate that message? And we'll talk about what the message is later. Secondly, they agreed that discipleship is the next vital step in the Great Commission. There are many, many evangelists around the world. Um, they get very frustrated with churches. Because, you know what? Churches are doing an important thing. Are you with me? And that's where the Christians are. They are leading the church and they're sort of like, you know, all the decisions are made there. Meanwhile, there are people sitting in your church who are being called by God to actually get the gospel to the non-church people. Are you with me? And so when the church tends to put across this message, you know, stop, calm down, be quiet, do less. You know, you're going to burn out. And we're always having water poured over us. Well, you find that the evangelist gets very frustrated. And what you normally find is that the evangelist will begin to despise the pastor, despise the worship group and the other things that are taking priority over what they are feeling is the top priority, which is to share the gospel. So they make a mistake. The evangelists that I've met over the years, over the last 25 years, they tend to go off and do it anyway. Um, and that's okay. But they do it, and they're almost divorcing themselves from the church. And they're forgetting again that community that God created. Jesus laid his life down for the church. So as horrible and difficult as you may find church, sorry, buddy, but you need to stay in that church yes, and be discipled by somebody. Who is teaching you? Who is speaking to your life? All right. I, I, I have also been in a church where a pastor says to me, <laughs> Tony, you know, it's interesting, as an evangelist, you preach the same message every week. Um, as a pastor, I preach a different message every week. He was almost making a sarcastic remark. And um, it's interesting because I don't think he could understand the challenge of the evangelist. It, I would love the luxury <laughs> to preach a different, fresh message to people every single week, gladly. But you, my friends, you try to preach the same message every single day of your life. That's a real tester of whether you believe your message. Wow. Wow. I'm telling you, friends, if you believe the message enough, you're going to preach it every single day until the day you drop dead. Wow. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, friends, what I'm saying to you is evangelists need to behave themselves. Submit yourself to the church. Submit yourself to authority. Yes. Come unto a pastor. Know your place, for goodness sake. Yes, sir. Are you with me? Powerful. 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 Yeah. And pastors and churches, don't sever the arm that's able to reach the lost that you want to fill your empty seats with. Are you with me? Yes, sir. You've got to work together All in right. perfect union. Amen? Amen. We've got to behave like a... And by the way, it's easy, isn't it, for me saying that. Some foreigner, I get to go back to England. <laughs> How difficult would it be for one of you folks to come up here and say this message and put it off if you're part of one of these churches... It's, that's why we need each other. I need to bring you to England. You need to tell the English bunch of people about this. And I need to come here and cross-cultural evangelism. Are you with me? Amen. What a mess. But it's okay. God's in control. <laughs> Third point. Christian activities can only be called evangelism if the, if the gospel is proclaimed. Amen. Now, this explains to you the tiny mistake you made earlier today. All of you, you see, I, I can see what you're doing. 
and I was being a little bit cunning. Sorry, I'm an evangelist. I do that. <laughs> Basically, you were putting your hands up to things that are connected to evangelism. Sharing a testimony. I've heard people share testimonies like this, for example. I'm going to make one up. Oh, um, I was uh, beaten as a child. My dad was an alcoholic and um, I hated him. I, went, I committed crime. I became an alcoholic. I went to prison and, um, and somebody said to me, Jesus loves you. And um, I gave my life to Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, would you all like to give your life to Jesus? That's a nice testimony, but it's not the gospel. I didn't explain the gospel to you. Yeah, sorry. I told you a nice warming story. But I haven't told you why you must be saved, yeah. how Jesus can save you, what you're going to do to be saved, and the cost of discipleship. Hallelujah. I've explained nothing but a, 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 a warm, fluffy story. My friends, use your testimony. It's very important. But stop calling it evangelism. That's not evangelism. That's slack evangelism. All that is, is you're showing a warm testimony, and that's the stuff to actually break down the barriers. And if you stop there, you're making such a blunder, right. such a mistake. Because all you need to do, you've done the great work by showing your testimony. Now go a little bit more and do the real work. All right. And share the gospel. Great stuff. Are you with me? Yes. So friends, you can only call those activities evangelism only if you share the gospel. So... For example, when I share my testimony, and many of you have heard my testimony more times than, I, uh, than, than you should have heard, um, I don't share the gospel until I get to the end bit, and then I make a change in my narrative, and I move into the gospel bit where I'm explaining that. Have you noticed that? Yes. And we'll talk more about that later. Are, are you with me? <laughs> are you still okay? Yeah. Yes. You're not upset with me yet, are you? <laughs> don't worry, I've been going, going back to England soon. So you'll be rid of me. You're doing well. Let's have a summary. Evangelism is the proclamation of the gospel. The evangelist, that is the person with the gift of evangelism who is able to reach and teach people, you know? The evangel, it is the gospel message that we are to share. And the evangelizer, well, that could be anybody who spreads or proclaims the gospel message. Anybody can be an evangelizer. Are you with me? Yes. Really, the terminology, somebody said it earlier today, uh, you know, uh, ranks, uh, titles, they're irrelevant. You don't need to be calling yourself an evangelist. <laughs> you need to be doing the work of an evangelist. Yes. Are you That's with right. me, my friends? Yes. Praise God. So here we are. At this juncture, can I just ask you very, very quickly, because I want to make sure I get the most important um, session to you now before we have a bit of a break. Um, do any of you have any pressing questions before we move on? Yes, sir? I was just asking uh, concerning the place that we all floor on. The place where Paul says you are a loving person, you are elected to the gospel. Is that now? Of the, of the, of the topic of the Muslim, the so sorry, I, I'm going deaf in my old age. <laughs> there's a, there's a, um, the, the Paul says, You are a loving and person, you are a letter. My letter of the gospel, you look like that. So I'm asking, on, on that Muslim, we all flawed. And I'm, I'm missing a point. I don't get the point, sorry. Do I must say point? Because you said we all flawed on that point. You know, all oh, yeah. the that we yeah. flawed on. Yes. But Paul says you are in loving person. So the, Oh, okay. Uh, so is 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 that where the, the, the avenger loving part to love as an evangelist, to be an in the person of Jesus Christ. Yes. Well, I sort of get what you mean, actually. Thank you. And I think it's important that what Paul is saying is what we need to be doing. It's to put it into action, isn't it? You know? So, um, so, so I, I, that's what it's talking about. So the, the, thing, the key thing here is that we can, you know, winning souls, feeding the hungry, uh, worshiping at church. Well, they're important Christian activities. But are they evangelism? Are they the proclamation of the gospel? Not necessarily. Very often we run church services... We have the lovely singing. We all know the songs. We love them. But sometimes there's no mention of the gospel anywhere. And yet we call it gospel music. Funny that, isn't it? Um, people have sermons. 
they preach and they teach, but if they're not showing the gospel, well, they're not preaching. We need to include the gospel, and it doesn't have to be very long. It could be like a two-minute message, but we, we've missed it out. Yes? Uh, I just want a very uh, question, and I just want to bring forth to you the attention. So, so we are speaking about the gospel. What exactly is the gospel? Is it Christ crucified, or is it prosperity, or is it the you knowledge? Is it because there's a lot of things, there's a lot of... Uh, Categories where the gospel falls under. So I don't know precisely. Yes, one gospel. Is the gospel Christ crucified or is the gospel uh, prosperity? Or because it all falls under the gospel. So I want to know what is the gospel exactly. Okay, well, you have dictated the next session. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so I obviously I heard you uh, speaking about like certain worship songs. If a worship song consists of the gospel, it proclaims the gospel. For example, how great thou art. It speaks about Christ being nailed to the cross. I scarcely can take it in. I was crucified for my sin. Can a gospel song draw a sinner to Christ without the, the physical, verbal proclamation of the gospel? Just by a sinner coming to church, we sing that song with the whole gospel contained in it. Crucifixion, resurrection, and the person of Christ, who he is. Can, that, can the Spirit of God use that song Draw that sinner to Christ without someone proclaiming the gospel in a sermon. Yeah. Well, yes, is my, my opinion, my personal opinion. Um, you know, there are many songs that they complete, complete a narrative that God uses um, to bring a conviction. Um, but I think that, you know, the Bible does talk about working out your salvation. And I think more understanding comes later. So, for example, now I'm going to show a presentation of the gospel. And this is not a song. This is a thorough presentation. However... It's not covering everything. It's like, for me, this is like the first 10 minutes of gathering the facts of the message. So it, as you're saying, a song, definitely there are some songs that really um, embody the message, that, aren't there? But there are many others which are just chanting and, and, and uh, words which are great. They have a meaning, but would they get a non-Christian saved? I don't think so. Um, I became a Christian in prison in Cyprus 32 years ago. And if somebody came to me singing a Christian song, I'd probably want to hit them in their face. And I'd probably want to do something bad. If songs meant nothing. But if I heard the words, maybe that would do something to me. Also, also there's a lot to be... Uh, to, we must never um, underestimate what, what, has, what seeds have been sown before they've heard that message. Right. Um, and, you know... So can I share with you... Because I'm going to be talking about the Gospel all day. I'm going to share with you what I think is the Gospel. Okay? And at the end, you tell me if you think this is the gospel too, okay? Here, here is um, a message which um, we, we, we share with people. And by the way, if anybody would like to have a copy of this, we have it in these booklets called Think. So I hope you like this. The Bible says that God is holy. And heaven's holy, and the word holy, it just means perfect. It's important to understand God can't let anything imperfect into heaven. Because if he did, it wouldn't be heaven. The Bible also says that all of us, we've got a body and a soul. At death, our bodies are buried or cremated. There it goes. But our soul, which is the real you, according to the Bible, this lives on forever. Either in heaven or hell. And there's no third place for the soul to go. Unfortunately, we've got a bit of a problem. Because the Bible says if we've broken one of God's laws, lied once, cheated once, hated once, just once, then our soul becomes imperfect and we can't go to heaven. Now, do you know anybody in the world that's never broken any of God's laws? The answer is no, and neither do I. So here is our problem, okay? All people in the world have broken God's laws, which means that all people have imperfect souls. So at death, um, if your soul can either go to heaven or to hell, and to get to heaven you need a perfect record, but none of us have a perfect record, then surely that means all of us must be going to hell. Now people say to me, Tony, that's really harsh. And people say to me, why would a loving God make a place called hell? Doesn't the Bible say God's a God of love? Surely he would never make a place called hell. God is too loving for that. Well, let me explain to you why I think he would. I would like you to think of somebody that you love. We live in a harsh world. So imagine the person you love is murdered. Boom, they're shot. And they catch the murderer who's brought to a court of law. There he is on the right-hand side. 
And the judge says to him, this is a really bad thing that you've done. But because I'm a loving judge, well, don't worry, I'm going to let you off. Now, you're going to be angry, don't you agree? Yes. But why? It's because you know when somebody's broken the law, they've got to be punished. That's right. Otherwise, there's no justice. justice. So you see, hell is not about love. It's about justice. Yes, sir. Wow. Now, let me ask you three questions that somebody asked me to help me understand why a loving God would make a place called hell. I'm so sorry, but in my life I've told lies. So that makes me a... Liar. Yeah, it makes me a liar. <laughs> what about you? Have any of you ever told a lie even once in your entire life? Yes. Can you raise your hand and show me, please, so I can see all the liars in South Africa? <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, all of you in this church, you're a lovely bunch of liars. Now, <laughs> thank you for being honest. And by the way, some of you, I noticed you didn't put your hand up. That's such liars. That's okay, that's the second one you told. <laughs> now, second question. I've taken things that don't belong to me, so that makes me a thief. thief. What about you? Have you ever taken anything? I know yes. you're liars, so put your hands up. <laughs> Thank you. So if you put your hand up, that means you're like me. We're the same. We're also guilty of being a thief. You take me once in your entire life, well, you're a thief, whether you like it or not. Yes, sir. Now, do you think God's going to let thieving liars like us into heaven? No. Not likely. Because if he did, then he would be the same as the unjust judge. Do you remember the judge who didn't punish the murderer of the one you love? <coughs> we can't have it both ways, can we? No, sir. But people say to me, but Tony, wait a minute. I'm a good person. Lying and stealing their small things, but I'm not as bad as you, Tony. I've never murdered a person. I'm not a murderer. And yes, I agree with you. Maybe you're not as bad as me. But what's interesting is how Jesus redefined words like murder. Because did you know the Bible says, if you've ever hated somebody in your heart, it's the same thing in God's eyes as murdering them in your heart. Yeah. So according to the law of England, New Zealand, America, South, uh, South Africa, you've got to commit the crime to be guilty, normally. Yeah, normally. But according to God's holy law, you've just got to think until you're guilty. So last question. Have any, have any of you ever hated in your life? Yes. Have you? Yes. I know. So that means that we're also guilty of being murderers in the eyes of God. Yes. And that is only three out of ten commandments. Please don't panic, I'm not going to ask you about the other seven commandments, don't worry. <laughs> but that's the bad news of the Bible, okay? The bad, ugly stuff is for the sake of justice. There's got to be a place called hell. But now let us look at the beautiful good news of the Bible. The good news is we can all be forgiven. Hallelujah. That's Woo! why Jesus is my hero. Jesus is my hero for many reasons. For a start, you know, let's look at the date. That's the 13th of May, 2023. It's that date because Jesus put the timeline. We got BC, AD, Christmas and Easter. So whether you believe in Jesus or not, your whole calendar is based on his life anyway. <laughs> you know what? Um, but what's really special is the difference between his soul and ours. Because we, as we admitted, are imperfect. Yes. We've broken God's laws, okay? But Jesus, the Son of God, is so different because he's completely perfect. Let me show you what happened 2,023 years ago. It's like Jesus looked forward in time and he saw you and me here today. There's Jesus on the right hand side and there's God the Father sitting in the throne. And Jesus turned to God and he said, Father, I love those people in South Africa. I love them. I don't want any of them to go to hell for breaking your laws. Is there a way for them to be forgiven? And God turned to Jesus. He said, Jesus, there's one way. My son, I love you. But if you go to earth and you become a human being, you live a perfect life on earth like nobody has ever been able to, and then you die a cruel, painful death on the cross and be totally abandoned to take the punishments that all the people in the world, including those lovely people in South Africa, justly deserve for breaking my laws, <coughs> then I will make it possible for them all to be forgiven on the day when they ask you to exchange their imperfect record for your perfect record. <laughs> and as Jesus was thinking about you, he said, yes, I'll do it because I love those people so much. According to history, that's what Jesus did. Amen? But there's something 
we got to do to be forgiven. Yeah, they say forgiveness is free, but not completely, because we have to do something to receive it. You know, the Bible says there are three major events in life. We've got birth, we've got death, and also you've got the day when you can ask Jesus to forgive you. Have you done that? It's the day when you ask Jesus to give you his perfect record. According to the Bible, we're not forgiven by just being christened as a baby, or by being baptized as an adult, or by going to church, or by believing in God. Even Satan believes in God. That doesn't save Satan. We're not saved by being religious or trying to be good. Yes, these are good byproducts. Jesus said that there's two things we've got to do to be forgiven. Number one, we must be willing to turn away from the bad things we do in life and say sorry to Jesus. Notice I said be willing. Yes, there's so many things we are not strong enough to give up. I know, and that's okay because God is strong enough to help you. But you must be willing and want to turn away from the bad things and say sorry to Jesus with your mouth. The second thing he said we must do to be forgiven is we need to surrender to Jesus. What does surrender mean? It means that if God made you in your mother's womb, and if God made the whole universe that surrounds you, then really, don't you think God deserves to be the most important person in your life? Surrender is when we acknowledge Jesus is God. And don't just turn religious and go to church only and nothing more. Live out your faith. Turn and surrender your life to Jesus every day. Amen. And that's what we need to do these, these two things in faith. The Bible says it is impossible to be forgiven, which means at death it's impossible to get to heaven. So my friends, say for example you decided to turn and surrender and be forgiven. Let me give you an illustration of what it would be like for you when you die. This is meant to be the delivery suite of where you were born. This is your mummy. There's the midwife, and that baby is meant to be you. And when you're a born, it's like God opened a book about your life. But remember, God never sleeps. He sees every attitude, thought, motive, and action. And every time you break one of God's laws, it's written down in your book. You can imagine that by the end of your life, there's a whole filthy library of bad things written against you. I think my library will surely be one of the biggest. But when you turn and surrender to Jesus in faith, it's like God takes your book and sends it to the top of a cliff and he tears off the pages from your book of all those bad things. He throws them into the deepest sea. The Bible says God promises to never remember the bad things again. He then puts a copy of his perfect records in the cover of your empty book with your name written on the spine of your book which is then stored like a precious library book in heaven. And look at the beautiful miracle. The miracle is that your book will not be touched again from the moment you turn to Jesus in a genuine way and the moment you die, even though you may break God's laws again and again. This does not mean you can say sorry to Jesus and sin whenever you want. Not really. This means that if you're genuine, if you're the real deal, there should be evidence of a changed life. And then when you die, you're going to stand before God on Judgment Day, next to an angel at the foot of God. God's going to ask his angels to fetch your book. He's going to look in your book and he's going to say to you, you were perfect. And, God's going to, and you're going to look at God and say, no, I wasn't perfect. I broke your laws. I had my hands up there and made the Baptist church and I agreed on my lying, thieving murderer. Don't I just deserve to go to hell? And Jesus is going to say to you, well, for the sake of justice, well, you do break, did break my laws. Some you broke many times, but you, my beautiful son or daughter, you have my perfect record, which I gave you, don't you remember, on that day when you turned and surrendered your life to me in faith, and I forgave you. So for that reason only, welcome to heaven. This is why Jesus Christ is my complete hero. But let me finish with this. What happens if you live your life going to church, singing the lovely songs, saying the lovely prayers, listening to another sermon, but imagine you never turn and surrender to Jesus. What would happen? When you die, you're going to stand before God on Judgment Day. And God's going to look at you and he's going to cry. 
He's going to say, I'm sorry people there in South Africa, but I can't let you into heaven. I've got to send you to hell. Because you never, ever turned and surrendered your life to me. I loved you so much, there were more than six ways I tried to reach you. Don't you remember? First, I died on the cross for you. I did that because I love you. Did nobody tell you about this? I did that for you. Secondly, I said to Tony to Mayfair Baptist Church on the 13th of May 2023 to tell you the message. Don't go around saying, oh, nobody told me. Because actually, actually, you were told that day. Third, there are churches all over South Africa and the world. There are some that were good, others I was ashamed of. You could have found the good ones to learn about me. Four, I gave you a conscience so you would know the difference between right and wrong. Fifth, I created a beautiful world around you. How could you not know I made that world? And finally, I rose from the dead to prove to you that I'm God and to shout loud that everything I said was true, but you still did nothing. I'm sorry, I'm not a thief. I can't steal your free will. If you're going to hell, it's not because I'm sending you there. No, if you're going to hell, it's because you have chosen it. So, yeah. My dear friends, what about you? If you died tonight, where would you go? Heaven or hell? If you're not sure, please remember, as we have a little recap, we need a perfect record to get to heaven. There's two ways you can get one. You can either be perfect, but I think we've learned that one well and truly. Or we can ask Jesus to give us his perfect record that we simply do not deserve. So what are the two things we need to do by faith? Remember, number one, be willing to turn away from the bad things you're doing in life. Say sorry to Jesus. Make a change, turn away, repent. Secondly, surrender your life to Jesus. Make him your king. Live for him every day. Unless you can do these two things, the Bible says it's impossible to be forgiven, which means that death is impossible to enter heaven, which is rather sad because this is why Jesus Christ died for you. Now, what hinders evangelism? Here are some wrong definitions I'd like you to look at. Satan wants you to believe that evangelism is winning souls. Earlier, you put your hands up and you said, Amen, didn't you? Yes, and I would agree with you to a point. But that is not the biblical definition of the word evangelism. Winning souls is what God wants. But if you define evangelism as winning souls, you are now giving evangelism a, an incorrect definition. <laughs> this man is called Dr. J. O. Saunders, a missiologist. And he speaks about, in his book, Satan is no myth. How Satan mixes truth and error to confuse us. I'm quoting from his book. He says that Satan's strategy is to include enough truth in his teaching so that um, the teaching of error becomes um, uh, credible and palatable. So much seems good and true that we do not detect the error. And Satan is ingenious, he says, because Satan uses an orthodox language while giving the old words new heterodox content. And that's why this is especially true in biblical circles, where theologians are speaking such complicated words and explanations, and simple people like me, well, we take a measure of understanding and then we go away with a wrong understanding sometimes. Yeah. Um, and just imagine Satan involved, he will try to mislead you. Do you remember the parable of the wheat and the tares? Um, this image is incorrect because um, I showed you this image with the, the wheat and this here. That's not what a tear looks like. A tear looks exactly like the wheat. Yeah. So that when you're looking at them, they all look the same. The good and the bad are mixed. And it's amazing because when Jesus spoke about that uh, in Matthew 13, the farmer, the, the workers in the fields, they found the tares because they were working closely. They recognized them. They went to the owner and they said, Sir, did you not see a good seed in your field? How? And, and the farmer said, Yes. So they said, How comes there's tares in it? He said, An enemy's done this. Matthew 13, verses 24 to 30. An enemy's done this. In a similar way, Satan is trying to sow heresy into the church into the, because he hates us, yeah. into our theology, because he wants to make sure that you're not going to accomplish God's mission for you. He wants you to be unfruitful, unsuccessful. 
And the best way he can do that is to convince you you're being successful but in, a, in the wrong direction. Um, there are five ways. If you think evangelism is winning souls, well, let me tell you, there are five ways you will damage evangelism. Every time you talk about evangelism, meaning winning souls. And come on, let's be honest. Whenever you do, we do a mission, whenever we have a rally, a church service, an invitation service, we're always at the end wondering how many people responded. Yeah. How many salvations? You know, um, how many souls were won? Well, with all due respect, unless you look at the Lamb's Book of Life, you're never going to know. The only person who knows who's saved and who's not is Jesus himself. So it's all very well measuring how many people heard the gospel, how many people made response, and now you need to follow them up. But please don't assume that they're saved. How can you possibly know? Um, let me tell you, there are five ways that this wrong definition will damage evangelism. I've got you now for 15 minutes and then I'm going to stop. Are you with me? Yes. Let's go a little bit further with me. Number one, failure. Yes, the failure of not seeing results. <laughs> you know, if you believe evangelism is winning souls, well, this is going to damage evangelism because of failure. Because you know what? None of you woke up today thinking, today, I want to fail. Did you? You woke up today wanting to succeed in your life, in your own work, in your family, in your church life. And so when we share the gospel, the actual gospel, if you're sharing the gospel, if you're sharing the gospel and the person's not saved, you feel a bit discouraged, yes? Yeah. Because you shared it so they could be saved, but they weren't saved. And so you're not going to give up. You're going to try again. You're going to try to reach another person. You share the gospel again and again. And still, nobody's saved. You're going to feel failure. Are you with me? And when you feel failure, well, you tend to give up doing evangelism. You might try to alter the methods, water down the message, compromise the gospel. And eventually, Satan, he can see you've given up because you, you, you were looking for results. And that was your mistake. You see, evangelism is the proclamation of the gospel. Yes, sir. Winning souls is looking for results. And anyway, did you think you could win a soul? What is your name? Jesus Christ? Only Jesus can save a soul. So why did you ever fall for the trap of Satan to believe that you could win a soul? Jesus did not say go into the world and win souls. He said go into the world and proclaim the gospel. Oh yes, and you're going to quote to me the old proverb. He who wins souls is wise. Yes, I know that one as well. Did you assume that Jesus is calling you the saviour? Did you assume that? He's not calling you the saviour. He's the saviour. We are the sowers. Are you with me? We sow the seed. Jesus is the one who actually makes it grow. So I want this to encourage you. Maybe you are sharing the gospel and maybe you've seen no results. Don't be discouraged. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. The second problem, if you keep on speaking with the language that evangelism is winning souls, let's win souls, because that's evangelism, you're going to make another problem. You know, um, it, it, the issue is bullying or manipulating. There are many people in evangelistic ministry that have become bullies. They are so forceful, so manipulative, uh, not intentionally, I'd like to hope, um, but somehow we, we, we develop this culture. You know, and I think sometimes we get it from some American um, uh, or Australian or English type of attempts where we see what's happening on in their big massive churches yeah. and we try to imitate that yeah. instead of imitating Jesus. Yeah. You know, friends, um, many people do evangelism because they want to see a quick decision for Jesus. They, they, they look like him. Mm. This guy here is a pushy salesman. <laughs> Is there anybody who doesn't work in sales? That's okay. Sales is a good job. But evangelism is not sales. You're not selling anything. The gospel is free. Yes. And so friends, we're making a big mistake when we, we take on this new culture of forcing people. Quickly say a quick prayer with me and you're saved. Amen. Hallelujah. We've got another one. Add it to the, to the numbers. Come on, please. You know what, friends? 
um, evangelism and the proclamation of the gospel is not sales. A third problem, if you don't see the um, fruit from showing the gospel, if you don't see results, another problem is that we water down the gospel. You know, when um, a, a drink is too strong, you add more water to it. You dilute it. Well, sometimes we think that, ah, the gospel is too strong. People are going to find it too hard to, to, to stomach. Yeah. So let's water down the gospel. Yeah. How do we water down the gospel? We stop removing the, the, the strong flavors. Yeah. We remove hell. We remove repentance. We remove, we remove sin. So the only thing that's left to taste is Jesus loves you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Come to church. Are you with me? Yes. That is watering down the message. And look at the problem. When you water down the message, the life-giving ingredients go down the drain. <laughs> my, my. Friends, preach the gospel. Glory. Our, our, the, the leader of our, of our life, of our, our, our religion, is called Jesus Christ. He came to bring this message and he was crucified. All right. Why are you expecting such a glorious journey Come on. Of, of supporters and people clapping for you and all the results and all the accolade that goes with it? Thank you. You know, Jesus is a servant. He became nothing. <laughs> yes. A fourth problem. If you think evangelism is winning souls, you're going to end up with fruitless results. If you're going to start watering down the message or becoming a bully in evangelism, the moment you start doing that, you'll end up with fruitless results. Um, in all of our ministries, we want to see this. Do you agree? Yes. You want to see lots of fruit. You, all of you, I, I know many of you here already, I know how hard you're working in your churches day by day to make it work, to grow the numbers, to reach your community, to, to, and you're doing such a lot. You want to see fruit. It's difficult because we've got to work with people. People are your, your biggest strength and your biggest weakness. They will let you down, I will let you down over and over and over yes, again. Yes, that's right. And that stops us seeing fruit. So we begin to compromise. We begin to water down the gospel. Mm. We begin to be, become a bit forceful in our approach. Yeah. You see, um, you're not going to see fruit. You might see people in your church, but they might be people in your church who are not saved at all. That's right. So you, you can't judge a, 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 a book by its cover. You can't look at a church and think, wow, there's 10,000 people. They must be fruitful. They must be sharing the gospel. No, one of the biggest churches in America is big because of popularity and, and they've become a liberal church and, and they've compromised the gospel. Yes. Uh -huh. They're preaching universalism. Mm -hmm. Don't look at numbers. If, if you want to see numbers, then you might as well pack in your Christianity and start up a, 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 a discotheque, a club, That's a right. nightclub. Get more numbers. You'll have more people going there if you want to see numbers. <laughs> right. But if you want to see genuine salvation, genuine start preaching genuine gospel. Yes. Yeah. You know what Jesus said? What was his advice? Jesus said in John 15 verse 4, Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So friends, if you want to see fruits in your churches, stop looking at the fruit. Stop focusing on the root. Stop looking at the fruit. Focus on the root. The root is Jesus Christ and his word, and he commands you to preach the gospel. Are you with me? Amen. Uh, by the way, I've been evangelizing now, well, probably for the past 32 years, but in an official capacity the last 25 years, and uh, you do see fruit. You do see fruit, but not necessarily in the way you expect. You might not see fruit until 10 years, or longer, or never. Final point, calling evangelism winning souls may, may also bring another problem. It may cause you to rule out very good methods of evangelism because it did not yield an immediate result. Let me say that again. We may call evangelism winning souls. A big mistake is that you start to say certain methods of evangelism don't work. Because they did not give you quick fruit. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. um, and actually, we do many events and many activities, and you expect to see a return, yes. you know? Yeah. And quickly, you want to see it visually. And also, many of us, we're depending on sponsors. And so, if we go to our sponsors and say, yes, there are three people, well, 
I'm sure your brother said there were 3,000 people who responded. How easy it is to compromise and to lie in our newsletters. Please, you know what, we're not called to, to tr uh, lying, we're called to truth. And um, please remember, we can't just rule out a method of evangelism because it doesn't give you immediate fruit. If you think that a soul must be won every time you share the gospel, you're not understanding what Jesus taught yes. in Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to 29. The parable of the growing seed. And in this parable, um, it basically speaks about a man sows seed. It says, a man sows seed, and day and night it grows, although he does not know how. First the stalk, and then the head of the stalk, and then the full kernel of the head. And then he takes a sickle to it. And he, he harvests the seed. Are you with me? Amen. Did you notice the Bible verse says, you can check it, in Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to 29, a man sows a seed, day and night, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed grows. The man's sleeping. He's not saying, come on seed, come on, come on seed, grow. That's not helping. That's not making the seed grow. The seed is growing supernaturally. You see, we, we can sow seeds, we can water seeds. Yes. Only God can make the seed grow. Yeah. You know, and Jesus taught us to expect the time delay between planting the seeds and reaping our harvest. You know, again, we must always evangelize, praying for the winning of souls, expecting souls to be won, persuading people so their soul can be won for Christ. Yes, but remember, evangelism is not winning souls. Evangelism is the proclamation of the gospel. Yes. That's it. Mm. Dr. J. I. Packer says this. The way to tell whether you are in fact evangelizing is not to ask the question whether conversions are known to have resulted from your witness. It is to ask yourself the question, are you faithfully making known the gospel? That's if you want to measure how fruitful you are, don't look at the numbers, look at your message. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Then you'll see how That's fruitful you are. Amen. 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 There you are. You know, we have gone through it quickly because we're gonna, we want to have a quick stop now. In a second, we have something for you. There are five ways that will damage evangelism if you think evangelism is winning souls. Number one is failure. Secondly is bullying. Third one is watering down the gospel. The fourth one is fruitless results. And the fifth one is running out methods of evangelism because they did not yield immediate results.